12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age and the beginning of the agricultural revolution, Earth housed six trillion trees. Today, we have just three trillion left. At the same time, in the last few years, we've seen a growing number of companies interested in investing in forests. Today, we're going to be asking the question, what is the business case? And given the size of the challenge, what should we be mindful of as we seek to scale? Thank you for joining this version of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit session focused on investing in forests, co-designed with MasterCard. I'm delighted to welcome Minister Lozano and our esteemed speakers on the panel and for our discussion afterwards. We'd like to make sure that this is an interactive conversation and so you'll be able to join the conversation through our application Slido. Please feel free to either scan the QR code or to go to the session, it's to the link itself and to ask your question. Please be specific regarding the speaker that you'd like to ask your question to and note that you're able to upvote the questions that you'd like to hear a response from from our speakers. In the second half of the session, for all those who are dialed in via top link, we'll have some breakout groups and some instructions are being posted in the chat at the moment. In the studio with me today, I'd like to welcome Nicole Schwab, our co-director of the forum's new platform for accelerating nature-based solutions. Nicole, what is the forum doing to stimulate corporate investment and collaboration on forests? Thank you, Jill. Uh, welcome to our participants and, and, and guests. In January uh, this year in Davos, we launched 1T.org, the forum's trillion trees platform in collaboration with Salesforce to serve the global community in our collective effort to conserve, restore, and grow a trillion trees over the next decade. This effort comes at a critical moment as the UN is about to launch the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, recognizing the severe risks caused by nature loss and the need to act now. And it is therefore with great pleasure that we have been able to, to launch this um, platform and um, we, one of the core components is to raise private sector ambition and engagement and to offer a space where companies can come together and share best practices, but also access the latest standards and tools for what makes credible commitments and what are the best pathways for science-based implementation of such commitments towards forest conservation and restoration. A few weeks ago, we launched the US chapter of 1T.org in collaboration with American Forests. And on that launch already, we had 855 million trees pledged to be conserved or restored. This is the beginning of what we hope will be a journey towards trillion trees and is a testament of what is possible, but most of all, what is needed. Thanks, Nicole. What does the forum aim to achieve with this new platform that has been launched? So as we are facing this dual crisis of climate change, but also nature loss and rapid degradation of our ecosystems with, with severe consequences for our livelihoods and economies, nature-based solutions offer a critical pathway and strategy to address these challenges. And that's why in addition to 1T.org with this platform, the World Economic Forum seeks to raise attention and awareness on action on nature-based solutions make sure that um, we not only look at conservation and restoration of our forest, but also how we can halt commodity-driven deforestation with the Tropical Forest Alliance, um, work on how to ensure that carbon finance delivers nature-positive outcomes, and then establish the roadmaps uh, for industry transitions from what today are mostly nature-depleting economies to a situation where we can build and establish nature positive economies and regenerate our ecosystems. So that's really our vision. And that's how 1T.org fits into this broader picture of engaging the private sector and other stakeholders in trans transitioning us towards a nature positive economy. Thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, we're going to move to the panel section of this conversation. Peter Manang, fantastic to have you here with us. You're the principal scientist from the World Agroforestry Center based in Nairobi, 
And I'd love to hear in your view, what is driving this increased company interest in investing in forests? Thanks, thanks, Jill. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here just to share my thoughts with you in terms of our experience working with companies. Um, a number of things come to mind when we look at uh, uh, growing interest from companies. Um, I think the first one, uh, which is, looks maybe a bit obvious, is the fact that companies are looking at very reliable and sustainable value chains, uh, supply chains for, for uh, 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 the material that they require, whether it is direct or indirect. A lot of companies are more interested in this in this sphere, uh, partly because of that. And, and you would see that, um, especially those in, in the renewable sector that I'm, 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 I'm part of, looking at oil palm and, and its contribution to the sector, the sustainability of that, that, that supply chain is extremely important. And looking at something like cocoa uh, coming from West Africa, which comes at a huge cost to the environment uh, uh, in, in Ghana, Cameroon, and Cote d'Ivoire is, is, is a very good example. Um, cosmetic companies, as you would see now, uh, getting share butter from the uh, uh, um, um, Sahel countries are also facing difficulties because that ecosystem is highly degrading and the trees are only naturally occurring. So in, in the future, if something isn't done to maintain the ecosystems, then we wouldn't have any, any uh, uh, raw material. But I think a lot of other companies are coming into this because of uh, the, the increasing potential of forest and the contributions of forest to climate change. 15% uh, of greenhouse gases come from uh, deforestation and forest degradation, but also from agricultural lands that are are highly linked to the supply and, and value chains of, of, of many companies. 50% um, of annual GDP is impacted by uh, forest degradation and, and degradation of, of, of uh, tree-based systems. So if, if that impacts the GDP, obviously the entire uh, 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 value chain of, of, of the companies and, and the, the, the systems, the economies are, are impacted. But I think a third dimension to this is really looking at the core benefits of, of investing in forests, really looking at climate change solutions, uh, big innovations in terms of medicine, looking at uh, 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 provenances from forest, uh, but also looking at maintaining tree-based systems for carbon capture and storage, for example, is a huge one. Uh, um, you would see, I work in the area of agroforestry, and currently we have 1 billion hectares of agroforestry land around the world. This is agroforestry meaning areas, farmlands or, or landscapes where you have more than 10% tree cover in the systems. These 1 billion hectares are actually at the moment holding 20 years of uh, continuous deforestation emissions from going up in the, up in the skies. So um, um, if we get more agroforestry systems, in the, in, in the landscapes, then we are virtually holding up, you know, a lot more carbon and, and making uh, the world green and providing more ecosystem services. Water, that is a service that many companies use. Um, we work a lot with, with breweries in, 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 in cities where we work on water systems uh, and ecosystem services. But I Thank think you, the, 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 the one last point I think is, is looking at the whole value web that the companies are involved with because no one company can do this. So I think a forum like this is extremely important where there are interactions and looking at how the companies come together. But because these are complex problems, the value chains are highly linked, they are non-linear. So we do need these kinds of platforms to be able to, to deliver on, on the ambitions that we all share, whether it's the private sector research or, or for, for a better environment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. You mentioned carbon capture, you mentioned supply chains, you spoke about innovation and food security, all good reasons to invest in forests. Let's hear a little bit from the companies. Christina Klobodans, you're the Chief Sustainability Officer at MasterCard. 
your priceless planet coalition is restoring 100 million hectares of trees, uh, 100 million trees, apologies. Uh, what propelled MasterCard to invest in this space? Hi, thanks so much, Jill. Um, if you think about MasterCard and the business that we're in, we're, we're a payments company. And for the last well, five years ago, we set a target to move 500 million people into the formal economy. We did that this year, and we actually increased that an additional 500 million, so a billion people. That's the same population that is the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And so for MasterCard, by investing in nature, we're able to address both and bring benefits to climate, community, and biodiversity. If you think about MasterCard, um, our own environmental footprint is not that significant. We're a payments company, but we have the opportunity for real change when we engage our network. And if you think about our business model, you issue cards through the issuers and the banks and consumers use those cards with merchants and retailers. And we have a reach of nearly 3 billion cardholders. So the role that we can play by engaging those consumers um, is we launched our Priceless Planet Coalition earlier this year. And the coalition, as you mentioned, along with our partners, has committed to regrow 100 million trees over the next five years. And with the expertise of organizations like Conservation International and WRI, we've created a global effort that is focused on projects that will drive the greatest um, global benefit and benefits to climate community and biodiversity. But as was mentioned just previously, we know it's bigger than any one of us and it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take government, it's gonna take business, it's gonna take consumers um, to work together urgently um, to address um, the challenges that we face for both people and, um, and the planet. And that's what Priceless Planet Coalition is all about. And um, happy to answer more, more questions throughout the session and look forward to speaking with people during the breakout as well. Super, thank you very much, uh, Christina. Kathleen McLaughlin, uh, you are Walmart's Chief Sustainability Officer and the President of Walmart's Foundation. And yesterday, Walmart came out with a big announcement talking about becoming a regenerative company with zero emissions by 2040 and a commitment to protect, manage and restore 20 million hectares of land. Why this? Why now? Yes, that's right. Well, you know, we've been working on sustainability for over 15 years now at Walmart, social sustainability, environment sustainability, working on climate, waste, nature, human rights, economic opportunity. But this week we did elevate our ambition in a couple areas. First, with respect to climate, we have taken our science-based targets, which we set a few years ago, I think we were the first retailer to set science-based targets for climate. And we've elevated our ambition to get to zero emissions in scope one and two without the use of offsets by 2040. So that's across our 27 countries, 10,000 stores, uh, our transportation network, including long haul transportation fleet uh, and so on. And so that's part of it. Second, we're recommitting and doubling down on Project Gigaton, which is our effort in scope three to transform product supply chains. And that includes forest products, as well as products that come from oceans and are sourced back to agricultural lands, to grasslands, uh, to decarbonize those supply chains. Our target is a billion metric tons by 2030, working with suppliers across those supply chains. And then third, and perhaps most relevant for this conversation, we set a target for nature. We're committing to conserve, restore, and better manage 50 million acres of land, including forests, and a million square miles of ocean. And these are landscapes that are critical for the production of food and other consumer products. So we're going to be working with our suppliers through business initiatives, as well as philanthropy, uh, to do that. And so it'll be a combination of improving standards 
for sourcing, working at landscape level in jurisdiction projects with people to change the way landscapes get managed and also making investments in enabling factors, things like traceability or transparency tools, capacity to organize these kinds of initiatives. So that's what we're committing to do. And really ultimately our goal is to change the way that consumer products and retail uh, as an industry work. We want to work in harmony with nature for the benefit of people. And, and it's what we mean by talking about becoming a regenerative company. We'd like the whole industry to take a regenerative approach. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Very inspiring to see the work that you're doing and to see the way in which Walmart is uh, breaking new boundaries in this domain. Ralph Fitzner, you are the uh, global lead on sustainability for the Volkswagen Group. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Volkswagen's put a very big focus on conservation in your work related to forests. And I'd like to understand why that made good business sense for you. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Good, good evening, good morning, good afternoon for, to everyone. Um, let me put that, that commitment on conservation also into, into context because uh, a bit other than, let's say, financial services companies such as MasterCard, um, the carbon footprint of Volkswagen really matters, especially if you take uh, scope one, two, and three into account. Because if you sum up uh, basically 10 to 11 million cars a year over the life cycle, you end up at approximately 1% of global carbon emissions. So whatever we do in terms of decarbonization, it really matters. And um, so our key aim overall is to become carbon neutral by 2050. And we also set interim targets first for 2025, reducing the carbon footprint of our um, life cycle of the passenger cars by 30% versus 2015. And this also includes a certain amount of CO2 compensation. And we furthermore just have released today um, the approval of our science-based targets. So we um, are happy to announce this basically first time to the public. Um, that we got that approval as well for well below two, two degrees pathway. And what's important to us in also having the, the diesel scandal and as a background, credibility matters. And it's absolutely essential for us to be credible in everything what we do. And therefore we defined a hierarchy of um, reduction measures. So starting first with reducing emissions by improving energy efficiency in manufacturing, for example, same as within our supply chain, Second, then um, rolling out uh, renewable energies. And thirdly, this is basically the last but not least measure, compensate a certain amount of non-avoidable carbon emissions. And um, in this context, we also just launched the ID3 as a first uh, carbon neutral car handed over to the customer, um, powered by green electricity and manufacturing, also from our battery manufacturers. But we believe it's important for our customers that there are really opportunities and options for carbon free or carbon neutral individual mobility. Therefore, we hand this over to our customers. And here comes the, um, the conversation into um, play, um, the conservation of forests, because first thing is, I mean, it's significance in size, what, what we have to do and what we have in our plan. We also love planting trees and have a lot of corporate citizenship activities and planted, I think, two and a half million trees over the last years in different areas of the world. So that's happening as well. But for the decarbonization program, one important cornerstone is to scale and to create an impact. And therefore, we believe forest conservation of endangered forest, um, protecting biodiversity, natural heritage is the effective and efficient way and therefore, we, we have a strong focus on these types of projects. Thanks very much, Ralph. I'd like to go back to Kathleen because it's really interesting that you have both a business hat within Walmart as well as a philanthropic hat. And I'd really love to understand what in your view is the business case for investing in forests and how did you make that case uh, to Walmart within the business? Well, what's become clear through the work of many scientists and others is what is happening on our planet with respect to client, climate 
and ecosystems. And it's clear that as a society, we are now exceeding the boundaries of the planet. So from a very basic perspective, as a company that sells food, that sells apparel made out of cotton, you know, and other things, um, we won't have supply of commodities to sell to our customers. And perhaps more importantly, the communities that all of us live in uh, are at risk. So whether we're talking about associates at Walmart or our customers around the world in, in all of these communities, um, you know, obviously the, the prosperity of nature is the prosperity of humankind. So uh, business case is pretty clear. And so for us, the reason that we um, pursue these things through business and philanthropy is what we're talking about is massive transformation of societal systems. So we just heard Ralph talk about transportation. Um, you know, we heard Christina talk about financial services and so on. Well, same thing in retail and consumer goods, you know, the kinds of things that we bring into our homes to eat or to wear or to decorate our homes. Changing the way all of that gets produced is a massive systemic undertaking that will take business action. It'll take philanthropy. It's going to take government action. We have to rewire the practices, policies, resource flows, tools, technologies, mindsets that are at work in all of these systems. Uh, so yes, it's, it's critical for business, uh, but it's critical for all sectors of society to collaborate. Thanks, uh, Kathleen. And this takes me to my next question. I'm going to go to Christina on this one. Um, we spoke a little bit about the business case. Um, and as you mentioned, Kathleen, uh, it's not just about one business taking action in one location or in one value chain, but we really need systemic action across all industries and within all industries. So Christina, I'd love to hear from your perspective, what support do you feel is needed for this industry-wide uh, effort? Yeah, thanks, Jill. Um, and, um, you know, it's interesting with Kathleen and with Rolf, I was shaking my head at, you know, at everything that they were saying, because, um, you know, we come from different sectors, but we're all after, you know, the same thing. We may be doing it in slightly different ways. Um, but as I've said, it, it takes all of us. And, um, and so I think, you know, it's interesting at MasterCard, as I mentioned, we're using our, our business model with our different partners. And so we are working with them to activate so that it's not just a donation or philanthropic, but it's actually part of their business model of how they reach their consumers as well. And if you think about the um, actually adding consumers into this as well, um, and consumers, we know they care. Um, and if we can actually help inform and inspire and enable them to take action themselves against their own carbon footprint, um, we really have a chance at, at a movement. And so, um, as you mentioned, Jill, we're, we're private sector companies and we know our business, but we're not the experts in reforestation. We learn and we're gonna learn from each other. We're gonna you know borrow from each other. We're gonna partner with each other, um, but, we also need um, we need opportunities to to learn and to continue to grow with this space because it is continuing to evolve. And so, um, you know, that's one of the things that working with the you know one t dot org and um, the corporate alliance that we've had the opportunity to have expertise. Um, engage with us and actually learn from other companies that might be one step ahead on our beginning to um, pilot certain things. Um, you know, so it's, it's going to take us all. Um, and, but if we can all get behind this, um, then we have a chance at actually reaching scale um, and real impact. Super, thank you, Christina, for that. Um, interestingly, in consulting with the companies, one of the issues that was raised very prominently was credibility. And Ralph, you mentioned that credibility is key to uh, Volkswagen and the way in which you're implementing your programs, given some of your history. How do you help to ensure that your programs are credible? And by that, I mean, uh, not just impact this year or next year, but in a decade from now, in a century from now? How do we make sure that the trees are still standing and the rivers are flowing? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great question, Jill. Thank you for that one. Um, so again, I think we have to differentiate between two parts. One thing is uh, corporate citizenship, 
um, CSR activities where we often do have projects which are close to company sites where we engage our employees. And basically, since it's close to sites where we planted, meanwhile, two and a half million trees, those, those projects are, let's say, adopted by our employees. Um, and there is also a close monitoring uh, by the people who engage in this. So that's um, yeah, basically the, the credibility side that people nearby take care of this. The other one, if we're talking uh, about this 1 million hectares, which is really massive um, at scale, um, then we have decided in our decarbonization and compensation strategy that we will only go um, with the highest standards, so either the gold standard or the VCS plus uh, community and biodiversity standard in terms of uh, certification. And that's one thing which helps us to get a certain level of credibility. The other thing is uh, that we also carefully choose our partners whom we work with. And um, going forward, we also intend to really set up our own project so it goes way beyond simply let's say buying some red plus credit somewhere on the market and then you post on your website we've compensated something but we are really going deeper into that we've selected the countries which we are working with where we have a footprint where we have operations so that also these projects despite they will be most likely in the, in the tropical area which are the most productive ones they are again closely tied to our business in that country Thank you, Ralph, for that. And turning to the grassroots, as you uh, talk about what it actually takes to have impact on the ground, I'd like to talk, turn to Peter and understand uh, from your perspective, how is the business case being made on the ground in communities that are interested in reforestation? What does it really take on the ground to ensure that this uh, impact is sustained? Um, a, a couple of things. Thanks. Um, really interesting question. A couple of things. I think the, the first point, I think, is, is, is really to make sure that the, the whole um, reforestation, restoration, forest uh, 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 investments are linked to local jobs. Um, um, working with ecopreneurs, you know, local uh, uh, businesses. So, making sure that the whole uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises linked to sustainable forest management, sustainable tree planting it is a big part of, of, of the business because without that, there is no commitment. I think um, a second thing is to really make sure that we are not only investing in the trees because uh, if you look at the history, we've planted so many more trees that, that we wouldn't be at the point of planting trees anymore if we were only looking at, at what we've done so far. But going beyond tree planting to tree growing, where the trees are actually meant to survive and, meant to, and, and, and managed in the ground um, is, is extremely important. And that means you have to design incentive systems that go with, with those that make sure that that the trees are managed long term and that the, the, the ecosystem services that are desired biodiversity are actually follow through because it's not a day in it's not a day's process, right? It's a long, long term process in many places. So that incentive system needs to be there. And that means uh, in many cases uh, where we have experiences across Africa, Latin America and, and, and Asia there is a big missing middle problem um, that needs to be addressed. And what do I mean by that? I mean, um, you have on the one hand, the companies and the investors with the goodwill up there and you have the ground uh, where the people can walk, but that middle level capacity at local level that understands the local dynamics, especially the tenure issues that relate to trees because um, land ownership, tree ownership is a big issue. And if you don't have people who understand that, working with you and having the capacity to follow through, then that doesn't really work. I'll, I'll stop there. But those are sort of like really some key and major things that, that would enable things happen on the ground. Thanks, Peter. Very interesting to hear your remarks there. And uh, this takes us then naturally to our next question and some questions that we are already being asked through Slido related to some of the criticisms that we've seen on tree planting initiatives. And I'd like to turn to Nicole for this one. 
On the one hand, uh, critics are saying, you know, companies should be focused purely on emissions abatement. That's where the attention is needed now. On the other hand, they say, you know, this is not so easy to do. Um, you can get it wrong with plantations, exotic species. How, how would you respond to some of those criticisms? Thank you, Jill. I think uh, what's very important is that we get away from this either or mentality because it's really not helpful. It's absolutely clear that we need to decarbonize our economies. And it's also very clear that we need to protect the ecosystems that are still intact, our old growth forests, and we need to restore degraded ecosystems. So it's not an either or, it's a both and, both for climate reasons and for biodiversity reasons. So that's the first point. Second, as Peter just made very clear, um, it's not just about planting. So of course the criticisms around, you know, uh, just planting trees are, are valid. It's about making sure that these trees are nurtured and have the capacity to grow until maturity. So, so that's the second point I would say. And finally, of course, it's not about any tree anywhere. It's about the right tree species in the right place, in the right context. It is complex, but there are sufficient examples that show us that it's possible. And, and, and as we've heard from the three companies here on the panel, it is a both and um, approach. And I think we also need to stay away from this simplicity and embrace the complexity and, and see the, the solutions that show that it is possible. Thanks very much, Nicole. Appreciate that. Uh, so I'd like to just uh, close out this piece of the panel by asking each panelist one question, which is, what has been your greatest learning in implementing your initiatives to date? And then we'll turn to Slido and get some questions from the audience. So perhaps first we'll uh, kick it off with Christina from MasterCard. Sure, thanks so much, Jill. Um, I'd say there are a lot of learnings. Um, I would say one of you know, the biggest learnings is don't, don't wait to start until you have it figured out. Um, start and set a big goal and, um, you know, and then, then, then you learn. Um, I, I think it's also one of the things that I've found is that people, when you talk about the criticisms, people typically think of nature as um, the victim and not necessarily the solution. And so one of the things we're hoping is that through um, the Priceless Planet Coalition and um, demonstrating restoration at scale, that we can hopefully change that and that nature is seen as the solution and therefore more investment will in turn come. Um, but, but Nicole just hit on it and also learning that it's not about planting a tree, it's about regrowing forests. And, um, and so with that, um, it's science matters. It science matters, and it's going to be really important um, that there's transparency in investments as well as impacts. And um, if we have that, um, then I think we have a solid chance. Um, but yeah, I guess the biggest learning to sum it all up is to get started because there's no time. Um, there's no time to stop and wait. We need to go. Thanks very much, Christina. Can I turn to Ralph to give your response to the question of your greatest learning in the process of implementing your programs? Yeah, <clears throat> happy, happy to do so. Um, and I would slightly like to rephrase what, uh, what we just heard in terms of start and learn, because this I'm, I'm fully with you um, if it comes to basically planting trees in, in areas where you have access and where you already know what's going on in the context. But um, the other thing I would like to mention here, and this is also one of our learnings, the situation, especially if you want to protect forests at scale, um, it's quite complex and you have to be mindful um, to think before you act and uh, not to do things without um, knowing the circumstances, knowing who owns the land, who has uh, ownership rights, especially if we go to tropical areas, um, uh, you don't have these um, typical recordings like, like in, in Western European countries in, in terms of land ownership. You, so you have to do a very careful due diligence, you have to do the stakeholder invo involvement on the ground, otherwise you would easily run into risks of um, violating principles of indigenous people of uh, running into reputational issues. So that's why we also have chosen to, to partner with an experienced project developer because otherwise, uh, if you are too fast, and on the other hand, I'm fully with you that we have to act fast, 
um, you have to be mindful about the risks. And this is one of our learnings. Hey, Jill, can I jump back in really quickly? Absolutely. Okay, good. Rolf, I I totally agree with you in the sense that I say act, um, but not blindly. Um, Mm -hmm. You have to act with, and that's why partnering, I think, with credible organizations um, that have the experience, that have the the credibility and the reputation and the science-based approach, um, you know, that I mean, as a business, learn from, from those organizations. By all means, yeah. Don't don't just don't just I'm run with you. <laughs> without anyone, yeah, without anyone in the seat with you, partner yeah. and learn from them. Yeah. Exactly. It's an interesting balance between making ambitious commitments and then actually implementing them, and uh, it requires perhaps a bit of both. Kathleen, unto you. What 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 has been your greatest learning in your position in this process, particularly focused on forests? Well, uh, first of all, apologies if there's background noise. This is the joy of live recording. My my neighbor has geared up the power tools. Not sure what he's doing. I hope he's not cutting down a tree, but <laughs> there's a bit of noise here. Um, I, for, for us, I would say um, it's to challenge this mentality of trade-off or either or and look for the natural overlaps between, you know, if you're a business, between business and addressing nature. Uh, and, and that's the place to work is that intersection. Um, we are all on this one planet together and the linkages between economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, social justice have never been more profound. So working at that intersection and then translating um, the nature goals into practical actions that a business can take in concert with civil society, governments, local communities, and so on, uh, and applying the same innovation um, approaches, problem solving uh, that you would bring to any kind of complex scientific problem or business problem to figure that out. Um, that's how we're able to make progress. Thanks very much. Uh, finally to Peter, uh, any thoughts from your end, particularly on something that you've learned in the process of uh, working on forests? I think um, a key phrase thing for me would be to embrace complexity uh, and, 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 and deal with it, you know, because, because there's no way we, it's not a simple problem. It's very complex and it does need many hands on deck and many brains uh, thinking differently. So that, that's really, and, and, and applying some uh, evidence-based approaches, basically. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Uh, Peter, I'd like to stay with you for a moment because we have a question from the audience here about how can we incentivize tree planting? What are, mm. What's the case that can be made here? And any thoughts that you have on that? Mm. Um, we, we've been working on a, on a number of incentives. So that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a suite of incentives that we do apply. Of course, you st- you, there's financial incentives, but there's also... Uh, um, um, at, at the same time, you apply financial incentives, um, more policy incentives, but you do have to come in with some rules as well uh, and be able to uh, apply these incentives as well. So we do normally talk about the carrots, the sticks and the sermons. Uh, the carrots being you know, the incentives that push people, motivate people to do it. The sticks being punishment in terms of violations of forest policies, infringements, uh, wrongful clearance, and then sermons being more the educational part of the story. So there's a suite under each of these three categories that we do our plan. We have a lot of experience on how it works in different places and in different contexts. Thanks very much, Peter. There's a question here for Nicole. Uh, What's the formula to take this to the top of government and private sector agendas? Well, I think that um, this type of panel like we are having right now um, is a way of showcasing what is possible, what some companies have already been demonstrating, which does show leadership um, coming from the top level of these companies. Um, And when it comes to the public sector, we will be hearing um, in the closing from Minister Lozano of Colombia, 
uh, the president of Colombia also supported the launch of OneT.org. And, and we really see this very much as a public-private partnership. I mean, obviously multi-stakeholder, um, but the way we are working uh, with OneT.org is from the beginning to engage the private sector at the highest level and the governments uh, so that this effort can really bring all the different parties along, as we've heard from some of our panelists, that this is really what is needed. Thanks, Nicole. We have a question here about uh, related to the, the issue of incentives, um, which uh, asks, what about incentives to locals to stimulate natural regeneration? That's much better than planting trees. I'd like to take that question to Peter, uh, given your work on the ground. Uh, what's your view in terms of stimulating and aligning the incentives with local communities? Oh, absolutely. That's really, really key in almost all of the experiences we have. Um, a, a lot of the times, um, some of the incentives would be building on local knowledge, um, using local technologies, using local systems, but also getting them to manage it themselves and actually get the benefits. Because um, we have uh, billions of people that depend directly on forest. And if you get them to, to directly benefit from it, uh, it's much, much, much bigger. Sometimes there are financial incentives, but there is a risk with that, that it, it, can, it tends to crowd out other motivational incentives that are more intrinsic. So um, you do need to look at the context carefully, but, but local incentives are really, really uh, the best way, way to go in, in most contexts. Thank you. Uh, a question here for Kathleen. Um, how did you determine the size of your commitment and how big is big enough? Yeah, so we worked with Conservation International to take our supply chains that link back to natural ecosystems. So mostly food commodities, you know, cotton as well. And we took our major commodities and then just mapped it back to understand what are the landscapes based on scientists' best estimates of typical yields in those regions, uh, translating into products that our customers are using around the world. And you know, we're in 27 countries, we have 270 million or so customers each week that rely on us for their, their food, for their families. Uh, so doing the math on that works out to about 50 million acres of land and a million square miles of ocean. It's largely Western Pacific fisheries um, and canned tuna is, is the main thing for us. So um, we mapped it back and that's our starting point. It's a starting point, it's a rough estimate. It's hard to you know, get the exact number, but we thought, well, let's start with that. Um, and then the notion is to work with suppliers and uh, with others, the NGOs that we work closely with, local communities, through a combination of place-based projects, but also things like improving standards and cert certifications, trying to progress towards segregated commodities, uh, much better transparency and traceability tools, building on some investments we've already made over the years in, in things like Global Forest Watch or other tools. And, and as I was saying before, it's really partnership and it's total ecosystem transformation that's gonna be needed for every one of these chains. How much is, is enough? Um, really for all of us as a society, um, it's the planet. You know, what folks like WWF and others have been saying is uh, we need to, to restore nature back. If we're at about 30% nature coverage now, we need to freeze any further loss and move it back up toward 50. Um, you know, that's, that's what we're hearing. So that, and that's gonna take a collective effort from everyone. Thanks, Kathleen. There's a second question, which I think is best placed for you to answer as well, related to suppliers. The question is, how receptive are your suppliers uh, to your focus on forests and what convinced them to engage in this agenda in a, in a greater way? Suppliers are very receptive. We have 2,300 supplier companies. So these are consumer companies across all categories already engaged in Project Gigaton. So they've signed up and they're working on meaningful initiatives to decarbonize their supply chains. And this is just an extension of that. What they tell us is they're hearing from their own customers, their own employees, their own communities about the urgency 
that we face both with respect to climate and natural ecosystems. And so uh, it's in their interest for their own stakeholders to pursue this. They say that they actually appreciate having a customer like us ask them to participate because it gives them a reason to turn within their own leadership teams and say, listen, Walmart's asking us to do this. How about we join in? Gives them a reason if, if, if there isn't alignment about pursuing this to do it and also support on building out capabilities. So we work with NGOs, we work with suppliers to help people who might need support to figure out what to do to go faster on some of these things and, and connect the dots. And I have to say, the suppliers, many, many companies are in the lead on this already. You know, there are a number of folks. You can look at Danone, um, Unilever, for example, uh, Mars, a number of companies are already out there uh, at the forefront doing really creative work around nature. And so um, there's already an ecosystem building. One Planet Business for Biodiversity is another example of a consortium of consumer companies that have started down this path. And we hope just to bring everybody along to make it accessible for all companies, regardless of what size you are, to just build this into how you do business. Thanks very much. A question for Peter Menang here, uh, likely from one of our young uh, audience members, likely a global shaper. They ask, how can grassroots organizations, including global shapers, help companies and NGOs reach their objectives faster? I mean, uh, local, local organizations are really what I was calling the missing middle, because we do need a critical mass of this group of people who understand the local complexities, who understand the tenure dynamics on the ground, who can, uh, can sort of manage the incentive schemes at the local level, um, who can actually be uh, sort of middle people in terms of conveying more complex knowledge to the local level, uh, work on trainings. Uh, that's our experience in terms of looking at how local organizations uh, and, and young institutions can do this. I mean, but there is a lot of capacity building that is required and there is some homework to do uh, um, that we do need to together build on to enable them to do that. But there is a lot of scope and, and, and we, can, we can actually further develop that. Thanks very much, Peter. Final question, and I'm going to pose this to Rolf. Um, how do you decide uh, where in the world to invest and how do you find your partners? Um, <clears throat> Well, one thing I, I mentioned earlier on, and, and Volkswagen has basically 120 manufacturing sites or 123 uh, all across the world, 660,000 people uh, working for us. So it's a quite a significant amount of people. Um, so, so one criterion is uh, wherever we do projects in terms of forest conservation or uh, tree planting activities, there has to be a, a link also to Volkswagen production or Volkswagen business in that country, which is not too difficult with 123 sites and uh, being all across the world. Um, in terms of scaling and creating an impact or creating a bang for the buck, we also said let's focus on tropical forests because basically they're more productive. So in terms of uh, storing CO2, the impact is, is much higher. And also if we look for, uh, for example, at, at countries such as Brazil, I mean, the, the deforestation is, is the biggest danger there. And wherever we can uh, contribute to stopping deforestation and forest restoration, I think this is the most urgent topic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we currently focus on tropical countries. Thanks very much, Ralph. I'd like to thank all panelists for your uh, Really fascinating discussion. We are now going to come to the end of the first phase of this session. If you've joined by TopLink, uh, please just give us a moment. If you're a part of our webcast audience, thank you very much for your time. If you'd like to collaborate with us, uh, please go to 1t.org or if you're based in the US, us.1t.org.